My name is Joe Freeman. I represent the D.C. chapter of the National Writers Union, and we are co-sponsoring this debate with the Center for Economic Policy and Research here in D.C. We have one representative from each of these organizations who have very strong opinion, opinions on the issue of copyright. Does it have a role in the Internet age? Our first speaker is going to be Dean Baker. Dean is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He previously worked as a senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute and as an assistant professor at Bucknell University. He has done, a wide re he's done research in a wide range of areas, including Social Security, the trade-off between inflation and unemployment, and the stock market and housing bubbles. He has written numerous books and articles, and I'm just only going to name two of them, Social Security, The Phony Crisis, and The Conservative Nanny State, How the Wealthy Use the Government to Stay Rich and Get Richer. And representing the other side, Dean is going to talk about why the whole copyright issue needs a sub sub substantive change, and he will speak first. On the other side, arguing for better enforcement of what we got, is Jerry Colby. Colby is the national president of the National Writers Union, which, in case I didn't tell you before, is also local 1981 of the United Auto Workers. Colby is an investigative reporter. He's written numerous books. He's the author of DuPont Dynasty and the co-author of Thy Will Be Done, The Conquest of the Amazon, Nelson Rockefeller and Evangelism in the Age of Oil. He co-wrote it with his wife, Charlotte Dennett, who is in the audience. They also co-wrote the report, The Imperiled Future of Copyright. Beginning the debate will be Dean. He's going to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Then Jerry will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. This will be followed by shorter rebuttals from each one. And after that, we will take questions from the audience. Now, I'm giving each of them a microphone, but if they interrupt each other, I'm going to take the mic away. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction, for setting this up. This is Joe's initiative, so I really appreciate the, you know, the effort you made in getting this together. Um, what I want to say, first off, in, in framing it, at least to my mind, this is not a debate over whether writers, uh, creative workers, should be compensated. Of course they should be. Um, I like to think of myself as being at least somewhat of a creative or intellectual worker, and you know, for my part, I will say I have managed to survive for 20 years doing that, and you know, actually I've made probably less than, I think over that time, $10,000 either directly or indirectly through copyright. So I sort of hold that up as well as saying that, you know, I'm sort of in this boat myself to some extent and that I, for one, at least have been able to do it without copyright. And that's sort of my point, that we need alternative mechanisms to copyright. So what I want to do is lay out, first off, the case as to why I think copyright is an inefficient mechanism. Secondly, I want to make a stronger point, or whether stronger or not, it's your choice, but that's unenforceable in the Internet age, that you know, even if we like it, you know, maybe it was a good thing, you know, it dates back to 16th century Venice, maybe it was a good thing then, but in the Internet age, it's simply not enforceable, even if we do like it. And then, then I'll say a little bit about laying out what I would think of as a better alternative. And again, the idea here, what I'd like people to take away, at least from my perspective, is that there are alternatives, not necessarily that the one I'm going to outline is the best one and this is the holy grail, but to sort of lay out how we can think about the issue, better ways to support creative and artistic work. And what I'd say about the current system, I mean, you do have, you know, people, you have Sony, you have Disney, it works very well for them. Um, if you're if you're Britney Spears, you know, you make a lot of money. Thomas Friedman makes a lot of money. The fact is the vast majority of creative workers do not do well under the current system. So, again, I don't see myself as arguing against writers or creative workers. I want to find a system that works better for the vast majority. Maybe it won't work as well for Thomas Friedman, Britney Spears, and Sony, but that's not my concern. So. Okay, the, the case about copyright being inefficient, um, you know, I... I, I worry about boring people with textbook economics, but you know, I, I sort of wish we get the Washington Post editorial board here, because kind of gospel in, in economics is we always want goods to sell, goods and services to sell at their marginal cost, and the Washington Post, and my reason for saying that is, you know, their editorial board, whenever someone proposes any sort of barrier to trade, they, you know, I think people just, you know, jump up on their chairs and desks and they go screaming about it. 
you know, when they were tariffs on steel a few years ago, you know, they had all these editorials with stupid Neanderthals, you know, they want to protect jobs, it's just stupid. Well, the point is, the exact same argument would apply to copyrights. I, I could say patents as well, I'll leave those out of the story. But the basic story of a tariff, the reason why the Washington Post or mainstream economists will say it's bad, is that, you know, let's say, you know, I have this shirt and it costs $20, if there were no tariff, we put a 10% tariff on it, cost $22. Well, there's some people that won't buy it at $22 who would have bought it at $20. Okay, so we talk about that as being lost consumer surplus, lost potential benefits to consumers to the economy. Okay, and we can measure that, and with the steel tariff, people did measure that. It was around $3 billion in terms of the, the net loss. Okay, well, the, in principle, the losses that are associated with copyright protection are hugely larger because the increase in the price relative to the marginal cost is enormous. In the case of you know most tariffs that we talk about, the steel tariffs peaked out at 30%, most of them are less, 10%, 5%. In the case of copyrights, we're talking about items, music, written material, movies, whatever it might be, it can be transferred at zero cost. Okay, we, it, you know, it's up on the web, we could all download it. You know, it can be transferred at zero cost. Instead, you know, we have uh, Sony or whoever wants is, who's ever selling and wants us to pay $15 for the CD or $30 for a movie or if we're talking about video games, you know, more than that in some cases. So we're talking about huge losses. So if the Washington Post to, you know, the people got so upset about tariffs on steel or textiles, whatever it might be, if they were consistent, they would be absolutely furious about the losses that you get from protection on music, books, whatever it might be. And I've done some back of the envelope calculations that say, you know, in the case of music, basically it's about one to one, maybe even a little more. So we have about 20 billion in sales of recorded music a year. The losses are at least that large, maybe even 30 billion, using very conservative estimates. And you get the same sort of story if you talk about movies, you know, recorded uh, movies, whether it's DVDs, whatever it might be. You get very, very large losses. So just from a straight economic perspective, you have a very, very large loss to the economy, in addition, of course, to the gains to the consumers that they would be able to get these for free. So in other words, in the case of music, the loss might be on the order of 20, 25 billion, just pure losses to the economy. And then on top of that, consumers would have 20 billion to put in their pocket that they wouldn't have to spend on the music. Okay, so these are very, very large economic costs. Okay, so that's just the first sort of basic story about it. Now there's a second part that I think is also very important in the case of, of copyright. Some people might disagree with me on this, but I really say it stifles creativity. I know it's supposed to promote creativity, but I think it often stifles creativity. And I'll just give you a few examples. There was an issue a few years ago, someone was writing a takeoff, the famous book, Lolita, you know, uh, Nabokov book, very famous book. They wanted to do a takeoff on it where they get it from the standpoint of Lolita as a central character. Now, I don't know whether it's a good book or not, who knows, I didn't read it, I didn't, you know. But the point was, it's a very interesting idea. Well, she was prohibited from doing that by Nabokov's long since dead, but his family members still have claim to the copyright. They prevented this person from doing that. Now, to my mind, that's a loss. I mean, you know, if you don't like it, don't read it, but it may have well been an interesting book, but copyright prevented that from taking place. Same sorts of thing occurs all the time. Video games, I mean, there's all sorts of derivations that people aren't able to do because copyright prevents it, or at least makes it more difficult. Uh, a great story along these lines, there was a group of people, a Harry Potter club, that wrote Harry Potter stories. You know, they wrote their own stories, and they just transferred among themselves. No one's looking to make any money up. They just transferred among themselves. They used a website, you know, but they were just looking to transfer among themselves. And the, the author or the publisher sued them to prevent them from doing it. I frankly don't know how that turned out. But again, you know, I want people to be able to write stories like that. I mean, I don't, I, you, should, you shouldn't have to worry about the police coming down on you if you want to write a story. And, you know, Harry Potter or anything else. I mean, it seems to me that should be your right. And last point, I actually, this is sort of a family connection. My brother and sister-in-law did a film a few years ago looking at bias in the media, and to show that, they wanted to use segments of news. You know, they wanted to take, you know, 30 seconds from CBS or whatever, show here's how it's biased. Well, they, they were able to do this, but they had to get a very expensive insurance policy because they were worried they would be sued, or at least the, the television stations that were going to show it were worried that they would be sued for copyright violations. So this is the sort of thing I don't think creative people should have to worry about. You want to show that CBS had biased news, go ahead, take a segment, do it. It shouldn't be the sort of thing that you have to worry about copyright. Okay, so I'd say that's a real loss to society, and it stifles free expression when you have that. Okay, second point, it's unenforceable. Okay, well, you know, this is, you know, it's not news to anyone that 
you know, when you have a system where everything is digitalized and we can transfer everything over the internet, it's very, very difficult to prevent enforcement. And you just get, you know, a lot of really crazy stuff, at least to my mind, um, in order to do this. I mean, the basic story is, okay, everything's in principle freely available, so then, you know, we put on locks. You know, all the uh, music companies and the uh, video companies, they're all looking to put on locks. Well, we've got smart people, they figure out how to break the locks. Okay, so what do they do? They go to Congress and they pass a law. It's legal design software, have software that breaks the locks. Well, I don't want the police running around looking at software. That doesn't make good sense to me. Okay, they actually have a Russian uh, computer scientist gave a talk on encryption, how you could break uh, encryption. Gave a talk at a lecture in the United States, it was an academic conference, he got arrested for it. I mean, that to my mind is nutty. You know, we really have gotten out of line. We're arresting, you know, computer scientists for giving a talk about how to break encryption code. Um, you've had other cases, you know, some of these have been well publicized where they've broken in dorm rooms and found, you know, on kids' computers that they've downloaded some number of songs. Uh, in some cases, you know, you have parents, they don't know what their kids are doing, so their kids have downloaded songs. And ju there's just recently this case in, in, in uh, Minnesota that many of you probably heard about where this, this young woman, Jamie Thomas, was charged with making music available on her computer, 24 songs, and she got fined, I think it was $220,000. I mean, that's a little steep in my book. Um, it's, you know, we've gotten to the point where it's really not very feasible to enforce copyrights. And, you know, I make the, the analogy I like to make here is if we were talking about the Soviet Union, we go back 15 years ago and we still have the Soviet Union, I guess 20 years ago. Um, you know, the Soviet Union outlawed all sorts of transactions, right? So, you know, you had people be selling, you know, blue jeans on the street. Well, that was against the law, you know, and people went to jail for that. I don't think we want that sort of society. I mean, that's, it's really not a good way to look to do things. And it's only going to get worse as the technology continues to improve and it becomes easier and easier to send things over the internet. So I just, we're at a point where I just don't think we have a feasible enforcement model. Okay, so we got that, you know, at least to my mind, copyrights are inefficient, they're unenforceable. What do you do as an alternative? Well, I wrote about this a, a few years ago, and it's just a very, very sort of simple, sort of basic outline of a model. I propose a system where I like to steal uh, uh, rhetoric from the right. I call it an artistic freedom voucher, basically modeled after the, the tax deduction that we get if you give to a charity or give to a nonprofit. Except the difference would be that it's it's a cash credit and it's refundable. It's, you know, so if you're a low-income person, you don't have taxes, it's refundable. And I arbitrarily said, let's make it a hundred bucks. So every every adult in the country gets a hundred buck credit. And they can give that to any any artistic person that they like, either directly or they can give it to an intermediary. So an intermediary could be an intermediary that supports, you know, blues music or rock music or classical music or writing. You know, they, they support mystery writing or investigative reporting, whatever it might be. And, you know, so it's treated very similar to the way we treat the tax credit or tax deduction, I should say, for nonprofits or charitable organizations that... You know, the, the state doesn't, you know, monitor it in the sense that I don't have to, you know, include the check or everything, but the idea is if my return is audited, I have to show them, yes, here it was. You know, I did give, you know, $300 to this charitable organization. So in principle, they're not following after me, but if I'm audited, I have to be able to have it be verifiable. From the standpoint of the person receiving it, they have to register just like a nonprofit would. We're a nonprofit, Center for Economic Policies Research, a nonprofit way to register and say we're a think tank. You know, they don't decide we're a good think tank. They just you know, decide we're a think tank and, you know, they, in principle, could audit us and say, well, what do you do? And, you know, we have to show them we did some papers or had some kind, you know, something that what a think tank does. You know, if we can't show we did anything, well, we might be in trouble. But, you know, that's basically the story. So they don't, they don't evaluate whether you're a good writer or a good musician. They just say, okay, fine, you're a writer. Well, you know, maybe you'll get audited and after 10 years you can't show anything you've written. Well, then maybe you have something to answer for. But that's, that's the basic story. Okay, and then the other part of the story is that you can't get copyright protection. You get paid once, you don't get paid twice. So the idea is that if you take money through the system, that you know you got whatever, 50,000, 20,000, 200,000, whatever it was, you get money through the system, your work is in the public domain. You don't have a copyright claim about it. Okay, and the nice thing about this system, to my mind, is it's entirely self-enforcing. Because suppose I'm, I'm a real wise ass and I'm gonna cheat the system. So I get, you know, my, you know, 100000 this year because, you know, people like my writing and they send me checks or I get it from an engineer or whatever it might be. And then I go out and I, you know, write my new novel and I realize that's really popular. So then I go, I'm going to get a copyright and then I'm really going to make big bucks. Well, what happens is anyone can see I'm registered under this system. So my copyright's meaningless. They just go, well, that's great, Baker. And, you know, guess what? We're going to make copies of your book and make them available for free and you can't do a thing about it because you buy it. So it's completely self-enforcing. I just have a copyright that doesn't mean anything. 
So you don't have to have the police go out. It's the exact opposite. I can't get the police to go out and enforce my copyright because it's meaningless. Okay, so I throw that out there. Obviously, there's other mechanisms we could talk about, but I think this is a reasonable one. The other nice point about this, I think it could actually be done at the state and local level. You can envision that you know, someplace wants to set itself up as a haven for creative workers. You know, I mentioned Detroit because I went to grad school near there, and Detroit's in very bad shape. I think it'd be a wonderful place that, you know, suppose they could get some sum of money through their, uh, through their tax system to make it available for people to do this. They could set itself up as a real mecca where people might come. I mentioned that also because I think of, you know, you have all these people struggling in New York City where, you know, they might have to spend 2000 in rent on an efficiency. You could go in Detroit and get, a, you know, a beautiful four-bedroom home with a yard for $100,000. So it might be attractive to people. But in any case, I, you know, I just throw this out here to say that there are alternatives. I happen to think that's a good one, but, you know, the point is to get alternatives on the table, get them debated. So the long and short, what I'd say is that, you know, we have a system that, you know, we basically use copyrights because they've been there. You know, they date back from the, the 16th century, and again, I couldn't tell you what motivations, what people were thinking in the 16th century when they thought it would be a good idea, but that's why we have them. It's no one sat down and thought copyrights, you know, that's the best way to go. So the point is, we can do better, and, you know, I'd argue we should try to, you know, think of a good system for the Internet age rather than trying to drag the country back to the 16th century. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. You be here. Um, some of you may have been to the Book Expo in New York this year. Some of you may have attended the Copyright Clearance Center's uh, workshop that it held. And one of the things you would have noticed if you did is that on the panel there was a representative of, of publishers, there was a representative of the Copyright Clearance Center itself, there was a representative of uh, companies that use works, but there was no writer. Writers are not heard. Writers are ignored. Their contracts are breached all the time. All the time. They even have a word for it in the industry. It's called privishing. To privately print a book instead of publicly printing it, publishing it. And they uh, describe publishing as printing. Printing is not publishing. And the Second Circuit in 1983 made that very clear. In a case called Zilg versus Prentice Hall, that a publisher must indeed promote a book if it's publishing, and that means an advertising budget that uh, gives a book a reasonable opportunity within its given estimated market. It means a tour, perhaps. And a lot of this is conditioned on advanced sales. But what you'll find out in the age of the big box retailers is that instead, publishers are moving very quickly on to the next title because what the big boxes want is sales. As much as they possibly can, they look at books as commodities, get them out, and they move them on. So your lifespan for a book is very, very short now, a matter of weeks, before the book is pushed into the back corners and most of the books are sent back to the publisher, where, by the way, in most cases, they are not any longer uh, used to fill back orders, but instead are put on skids sent out to warehouses and burned. Very often the writer does not know this is happening. When his book is, or her book, is, is privished, it's done secretly. In other words, a breach of contract takes place and it is throughout the industry. It is one of the biggest scandals and no one talks about it. Now, why am I raising that in this context? I'm trying to explain something about the way publishers very often function. Not all publishers, but the way the industry has problems that are endemic to the industry. The way it's structured. And, the, and some of that has been aggravated by the uh, conglomerates that have emerged. 
where media consolidation has resulted in companies, some of them not even media-based, taking over publishing houses and imposing demands for certain yields or rate of returns every quarter that buoys up their stock value, but is completely beyond the tradition of publishing, where 8 to 11 percent was a good year. Now the demands are for, for things like 30 percent. 20 to 30 percent, like a cable company would produce. So that the balance of power inside publishing houses has shifted from the editors and the church, as we used to call them, to the state, which are the bean counters. Now what is be driving all this is not where I'm going. Where I'm going is that there is a fundamental breach of something going on. And that is the writer's copyright too. What publishers very often are engaged in right now is selling rights that they have essentially forced writers to surrender at the risk, you might say, of unemployment. They're called the all rights contracts. Now the all rights contracts, I first saw my first one in 1992, was introduced by Random House. Then they withdrew it, now I understand they're coming back with it. The all rights contracts simply state that you must grant, if you want to be published, all rights in all languages, in all geographies, all areas of the world, even throughout the universe, in formats yet to be invented. Now, as you know, freelance writers and authors make their living by selling off rights. Actually, your copyright is a bundle of rights. And there are dramatic rights, there are geographic rights, there are language rights, and so on. And if you have a good agent, you can get some good sales. But with the development of the internet, with the development of the global market, the corporations saw right away an opportunity that was unparalleled for a world market. The only thing standing in the way was the writer. So how do you deal with it? You introduce the all rights contract. If they want to get published, or otherwise get out of here. Now, that, is that a restraint of trade? Yes, we can make some arguments. I wouldn't make it in the state of Massachusetts where they give, they have contracts of adhesion, take it or leave it contracts. But there are other places. And certainly there's a question about interstate commerce. Especially when you have a monopoly situation like the New York Times with the Boston Globe's domination of the, uh, of the freelance market in Boston, using its ownership over the Boston Globe to impose monopoly pricing for goods and services, in this case, the sale of articles by writers. But writers are unorganized. They're individuals standing before huge corporations. And as loan atoms, they're easily destroyed unless they surrender. So, what were you, what's at stake? What's at stake here is two things. First, the capacity of the American people to engage in self-rule, especially in the area of nonfiction. We're talking about reporters and journalists, for instance. If they are not able to make a living as a writer, you're only going to have staff writers. And you'll not even have staff writers. What you'll have is farmed out writing assignments to India, to wherever, and they'll come back with a homogenized story, and that will go through all the chains that are controlled by Gannett and all the rest, and you end up with no real investigative journalism. And as you know, that's what's happening in journalism. Investigative journalism is being cut back, and entertainment is rising. Now. I mean, I remember, and I'm sure other people remember, walking along uh, publishing houses and seeing what editors did, uh, what they do best, and that was editing. 25 years ago, it began to change. And you could see, instead, editors watching TV. 
they were looking for the latest celebrity they could build a book about. And they would find a ghostwriter, they would package it together. And by the way, in some cases, ideas are even taken in the publishing industry. And not just ideas, even manuscripts, and they end up on the, on the, uh, on the market under another name. In other words, actual manuscripts are being stolen. And there are a few cases that are going to be coming up very soon that you'll be hearing about. Now, I think this is a, 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 could be a very rampant problem pushed by the global trade. Now, the copyright for a writer is the basis of his survival as a writer. Without the copyright, he's at the complete mercy of the companies. Now, what happens in a situation like this? Oh, do we have abuses of enforcement of copyright? Yes, we do. I think Dean did us all a favor by bringing this case recently of, a, of Jamie Thomas, a single mother in Minnesota, who was fined $220,000 by a judge for allowing other people to download 24 songs off her computer on a file sharing system. That's absurd. When we talk about enforcement, we're not talking about going after kids. And these kind of examples are used by, by people that want to erode copyright. The National Writers Union is not going to allow that to happen. We're going to fight very hard on this. I also object, and I think any writer would object, to the denigration of copyright. in a way that, for instance, would compare it to uh, restrictions that prevent uh, generic drugs from being introduced. What we're talking about here is an entirely different kind of situation. We're talking about writers' capacities to survive. And it is not something, copyright is not something that's comes out of feudal age. Historically, copyright emerged out of the struggle against feudalism, against the king's control over what was properly, uh, what could be available in terms of manuscripts, against even the guilds themselves. I'll give you some examples. It came out of the impact of movable type, we all know that, the Gutenberg Press, and the movement to an enlightenment and the development of a market system that made it, the restrictions of feudalism impossible. And the battle was on. As a matter of fact, it was the abuse of monopoly rights that caused the English Revolution and the king his head. And it was after that and the erosion of the perpetual right of printers in their control over, over books. It was out of that that the struggle for what emerged as the Queen Anne's Act came to fruition. For the first time, authors were given ownership of what they created by law for the first time. And it wasn't just authors, by the way. There's a balancing of interests here. The public has an interest, namely if you buy something, you have a right to give it away. It's your property. Once the sale is completed, uh, no one can restrict you from that. At the same time, uh, there's a balancing of the interests for the publishers, too, or the printers in those days. But the point is that the copyright was vested in the hands of the author. Now, as that emerges, as that develops, you see the requirements for deposits in a, in a registry in England. It's similar to what we have as a legacy of the requirement of registration by the U.S. Copyright Office if you want to get access to punitive damages. I will argue that the biggest problem that we have as writers is not that copyright is unenforceable. It is enforceable. There, the technology does exist. The spiders exist for the searches. 
the water marks exist that allow for codes under a disguise of noise. Uh, and there are signatures that will tell you exactly what is the copyright date, who owns that copyright, and what are the terms. No one wants to talk about that technology except the Europeans. Now Europe, for instance, uh, is starting to move in that direction and the adoption of the, the Australian models of this a system that was set up, which has just been endorsed as a standard by the International Federation of Repographic Rights Organizations, Reproduction Rights Organizations. Europe is way ahead of us. They are enforcing copyright for writers. Writers, for instance, have required collections, required by the law, not voluntary, by law. And they don't give exemptions, by the way, to schools. No, no, just as teachers should never have been asked to subsidize the American educational system, so also neither should writers. Writers have a right to fair compensation for their works. Fair, not exorbitant, but fair because they make the investment. And if you look at all this situation only from the view of the consumer, you're playing right into the hands of those companies that would like to eliminate writers' rights. I, uh, I think I've got a few more minutes. Do I? You have one more minute. One more minute. American corporations right now, particularly Google, for instance, as a good example, are trying to avoid being encumbered by international law, copyright law. This is not unusual for America. American corporations have been wanting to avoid being encumbered by international law and standards all the time. We see it in large and bore against the League of Nations. We saw it in the opposition to the Genocide Convention. We see it in the opposition to the Geneva Conventions Against Torture, and we see it in the Berne Accords right now. Because Europe is collecting copyright required um, royalties through a survey system from educational institutions and from corporations, which use them more probably than anybody else, and governments, government agencies. And where does that money go? It goes to the writers. Because in Europe, writers are unionized. Because in Europe, writers can say things in Parliament because they have representatives. But who dominates in Congress but corporate power? That's where the struggle is. That's where the abuse is. And that's what the American people have to respond to. I think I'd agree with Jerry probably 80 or 90 percent of the way. I mean, again, I, you know, part of my reason, you know, I emphasize the consumer aspect. I'm sorry, my economist is in your brain, but, like, okay. But, you know, the, the point that, that Jerry is making that, you know, most writers, and we can carry that further, most people make music for a living, perform music, they don't do very well. They're not getting very much. Who gets a lot? Obviously, the big corporations. And you do have the Thomas Friedmans, the Madonnas, you know, the big stars. And that is the nature of the model now. Now, we could talk about reversing that, but frankly, I'm not terribly confident. I just see it keep getting worse and worse. And someone was telling me of a study. I kept trying to get them to give it to me. I've not actually had it in my possession, but they just looked at the uh, New York Times bestseller list, and they find that people are on the New York Times bestseller list much longer periods of time on average now than 20 years ago, and there's also many more repeat authors. Now, you might think that the crew that happens to be there today are just so much better than the crew that was there 20 or 30 years ago, but I kind of doubt that. I think it's the change of the marketing model that, you know, what happens now, there's economies of scale, so they're going to build Thomas Friedman up, and right now he could probably put out the phone book with his name on it and get a million people to buy it, you know? You know, it's the same with music. It's the same thing. That's a model that works well for the corporations. It works well for Thomas Friedman and a few others. The vast majority of writers, of musicians, creative workers, get almost nothing by that. So I'd say I very much want to see a situation in which writers 
musicians, you know, other creative workers can get fair compensation. I just don't think the copyright system does that. You know, just one more thing along those lines, textbooks. You know, to my mind, it's a huge, huge scandal. Textbooks can cost them $150, $200 now. And why is that? Because you have these big textbook companies, they build up the textbook, and they make it fatter and fatter, and they all throw in little things, new graphics and, you know, software and stuff. It's all because they have this marketing model that has economies of scale by building up the big textbook, rather than just giving a student a textbook that gets the material they need. You know, so it's, it's, it's a very perverse marketing model. You know, some of that, if you're, you know, a Greg Menke, I mentioned a big economist or whatever, you know, you're a really big name, you could do well on that, but the vast majority of people get very little out of it. So I think it's just a very, very backward system. So, you know, what I'd argue is that we should be looking for a system that really tries to take advantage of the technology that's out there and look for alternative mechanisms for financing. And I understand, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, we have tight budgets in the world, but I think it can be done in part because you know, people could see a clear gain if they could, you know, again, I'll bring the consumers here in that. If people could say, okay, you know, maybe I'll pay, you know, money has to come from somewhere. So my, we have my artistic freedom voucher, you know, people have to pay the taxes for it. But what that means is that they can get, you know, a huge amount of music that they might want free, a huge amount of books that they might want, they can get them downloaded free or printed out. I actually brought these, I wasn't going to try and do a sales pitch, but I think it's a good contrast because I have two books that I wrote, one of which went with a, a publisher, Cambridge University Press, respected academic press. And one of which we self-published, uh, Lula uh, Press, that you know you can download this for free or get it printed out for the cost of printing and shipping. I think it's about seven dollars. Well, this one, Cambridge University Press, and I don't mean to malign them or anything. They were fine by me. I'm not criticizing them. But you know, you want to get a copy of this. You, I think I get fifty cents. It'll cost you twenty bucks. I'll get fifty cents. It's nice, but actually, separate gets fifty cents to be precise. But in any case. You know, it's, it's not going to make a big difference to me. So we decided, why don't we make this thing available for free? You know, we're missing a few thousand bucks, but guess what? We have this available for free on our website, and tens of thousands of people have downloaded it. Okay, so I'm really happy about that, because I wrote this. I didn't expect to get rich by writing it. I wrote it because I had some arguments that I wanted to make. I wanted to get out there. By making it available for free, we got it out there. Okay, a lot more so than I suspect this book, which, you know, I like it. It's a good book, but, you know, a lot more people will read this one because it's free. And I should also make a point, you know, one of the things I like about this, it does create a dynamic, because the people want to say, Baker's an idiot. You know, they want to write their book saying, you know, Baker's an idiot. Well, you know, they could do the same thing I did, or they could have it be a copyright protected book, and, you know, they're probably going to sell three or 4,000 copies. So many more people are going to hear my argument than will hear their argument saying I'm an idiot. Okay, so, so anyhow, I just say that, you know, I want to design a system that writers, you know, can get fair compensation. I don't think the copyright system is doing that now. I think Jerry agrees with me on that. The question is, what's the most logical way forward? And I think we can look to mechanisms. I'm not saying that an artistic freedom voucher idea is perfect, but you know, something along those lines that says, look, let's give the people the money up front and then take advantage of the technology. Let's get it all over. Don't use it to bottle things up. Let's use it to get it all over. And, you know, and then everyone benefits. Well, um, there's some specific things I think we have to deal with, but one of the, no one's arguing about your, about anyone's um, right to give anything away for, for free. Fine. Do so. I can't afford to do that as a writer, except in certain cases. I have to make a living as a journalist. And I work, I risk, in some cases, journalists risk their lives because they care about the story so much. And freelancers in particular will walk away from an editor to follow a story, walk away from a job, walk away from a company and a, and a regular paycheck because they believe in the story. Now that is something that's precious in a democracy and in people's capacity, again, to self-rule by getting the information they need to do so. So no one's arguing about giving something away, you want to get your stories out. I've done that in the past myself, in some cases. But if you want to keep publishing in a way that writers can make a living, you have to deal with copyright. And you also have to address some of the abuses, all the abuses, I would say, that Dean raises, that the publishing industry imposes. Do you know that the average, that the rates of uh, Royalties for hard copy texts, hardcover texts, haven't really changed 
in probably a hundred years? Could you imagine any other type of work and never getting a raise for generation after generation after generation? I'm amazed that we have as many writers as we do. Now granted, there's a large push on the part of writers, and that's, we're not all always altruistic. Sometimes we want to see a reward if you write a long period of time for something, or you do research on it. My book on uh, Rockefellers on the Amazon, for instance, based on primary documentation, took 18 years. I had to go out and raise the money to carry out that research. I have nothing, no argument at all about um, subsidies, subsidies from the government to help me do research on what the CIA was doing in the Amazon. Love it. Okay, but I realize that on our system, the reward comes after the book is published, not before. And frankly, the only way you can actually go ahead is hopefully you get an advance on those royalties. It's a loan. It's not something that's given to you up front. And at, at, with that advance, when that runs out, then it's up to you to raise the money. And you're just like a filmmaker. You go out and you, you might even uh, not only take loans or try to get grants, but you'll also sell percentages of your book. I've done that to finish a project. But the point about that is that I couldn't have raised that money unless I had copyright, unless I had control, that I could sell a percentage of a particular right. So we're down now to, the, to a reality about journalism, but also about novels and about other works of art. We're down to the fact that if you want to survive, you need not to throw the baby out with the bath water, and the baby is copyright. You want to nurture that baby. You want to see it grow. You want to see it be able to protect the creators, precisely so the innovation continues. That is not the way it is now, and that's why we encourage all freelance writers to organize themselves, to come together, to make an impact on the industry because alone you'll always unless you, you unless you a lightning strikes and the market responds or it gets an opportunity to respond you're not going to win you have to have unions that's what they learned in Europe and the reason why we have such a difficult situation in this country right now for writers and for workers too including all intellectual workers is because we don't have viable unions. And that has a lot to do with the lack of a political movement to create one. We're now going to open it up to questions. On a skill microphone. You two will have to share this one. And uh, I'm going to give this mic to whoever wants to ask a question so that it will get amplified. And I would appreciate it if you give your name and the organization you're with so that we can record that for posterity. There's a video camera back there. We want all of you to let the world know you are here. Anne Hoffman from the National Writers Union. Um, I'm intrigued by Dean's idea, but I wonder how the individual non-Tom Friedman creator is going to get hands on the money from all these taxpayers um, except from their own friends and family. Okay. Glad you asked that. First off, I want to say this is, uh, I realized uh, when Jerry was making this point about unions, we, you know, people who know uh, the CPR know we do a lot generally on the side of unions. This is the first time I think I've ever debated opposite the union person, so uh, change of place for me. Um, but anyhow, uh, so okay, so how does this work in, in practice? First off, just to, to be clear, this is an individual voucher. So I, you know, just to distinguish, I, I designed this that way because I don't like the idea of the government being responsible <coughs> necessarily post the government subsidies 
in all forms or anything, but I think it's better that the main source of support come from individuals. So you or I, you know, we have our $50 or $100 or whatever. Okay, so I envision two mechanisms. One is that, you know, to some extent, some of it may go directly to, you know, to Thomas Friedman. Some of it may go directly to people that, you know, we happen to know because they live down the street from us and we go hear them play music in a bar or we know them because they're a good writer and we talk to them when we go have lunch or something. You know, so some of them may go that way. What I envision is probably the vast majority would go through intermediaries. It's, so a system has to have a system of intermediaries similar to publishers that, you know, would say, look, we sponsor um, great distribution, <coughs> we sponsor great investigative reporting. You want to see good investigative reporting? You know, give us your check, you know, part of your check, whatever it might be, because, you know, here are, you know, 50 great stories we did last year. So you would, you know, they would, you know, be out there saying, you know, we, you know, give us money to us because here's what we do. You know, so you, and you can say, you know, they put up on the web, here's what we did. So that's what I envision would be where most of the money, how most of the money would be passed through, but clearly some of them, some of it would go directly from, you know, the taxpayer, you know, and their credit to, you know, the writer, musician, whatever it might be. Jerry, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, First place, the question is, uh, let's assume that there's $20 billion annually available, I think, as you raise as a figure. Um, how is this to be distributed? You say the intermediaries. Will these be elected bodies? Will they be representative of different groups? How will they be appointed? How will they get to get that power? And what accountability is involved in it? Second place, I think $40,000 was a figure that you used for uh, that right about how much would be available for each writer. Oh, just an arbitrary number. I mean, there's, yeah. not, there's no limit. Some presumably get hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. Some you know, people don't want their work. Well, that's an interesting point because if we look at this closely, we have to examine the question of who is more likely to get more money. And that, if it's determined by uh, how many, who knows about people, how many people know about me or you or anybody else here in this room, uh, there are other mechanisms that are involved that skew that. Skew the process of decision making and where the money goes. It could include advertising, just as it does now. And who would actually be controlling that? Uh, would this distribution therefore be skewed by wealth and resources? Uh, how would you split up the voucher? Uh, uh, and the, I think the, the issue here on also, focusing on the cheaper cost um, for distribution of works that the internet provides. I'm a little off on this. I just want to make this point, though, if I can. Um, there, are, there are two stages, well, not actually two stages, but part of the production of the commodity is the cost of production. The other part is the cost of transportation and the services that go around to deliver the good into the marketplace. The internet provides an incredibly cheap, if almost in some cases zero cost, to move information. But the production of the information is not the same as its distribution. We have to be clear about that. That's where the creator comes into the picture. And you have to make sure that the creator gets a return. So let's not just focus on the, I think there's a tendency to focus too much on the transportation issue, if I could say it, in the moments of the creation of a commodity. Speaking not as an economist, of course. Okay, someone else? Please identify yourself. I'm a, Rona Pavis, I'm a freelance writer and a member of National Writers Union. And I'm really glad you're focusing attention on this issue because it means you realize that creative people aren't getting the right amount of money at the right time. So that's a good start. I was wondering if you envisioned any other approaches. First of all, I was thinking, you know, you're setting the, um, average, you know, the fee at 40000 You say it's arbitrary, but in a way it sort of indicates the lack of respect society gives to creators versus destroyers, you know. In other words, if you're a general in the military, you'll get a lot more money than a writer. And, you know, there used to be something called common law copyright, that when you created something, 
It was yours, your creation. And it seems now that's almost like non-existent. And another thing in your approach is you talk about um, the writer being paid once or the creator being paid once. Now, somebody could have a book published one year and a whole, you know, millions of people are going to discover it five or ten years from now. The writer will not be rewarded for that, right? Under your system? That's right. I mean, it's, it's in the public domain. They're paid once. And actually, I suspect most writers are probably already in that situation where they sign away their copyrights at the time they write it, so that wouldn't be a qualitative change. But, you know, again, the way I propose it is that that system would exist in, in competition with the copyright system. So, you know, if you'd rather go with the copyright system and take your chances that, you know, five years or ten years down the road, that, you know, your book's going to become a bestseller, do it. You know, you just don't take... You, that your system nullifies them. If you take the money under the system, that's right. You, you know, this is an option. Here, here you could be in the AFB system, and the condition of being in the AFB system is you don't get a copyright. So you got... You know, you got your check, whether it was 10000 or it was 100000 whatever it was, you got through the AFE system, but the condition of getting that check was you don't have a copyright. So if you if you think your book might be this bestseller 10 years out, don't take the money. I mean, you don't get paid twice. That's, that's the idea. So it's not, you still have you still have the option. If you think you're going to be a great writer, you're going to be a hugely popular writer. Let's say that. We don't care whether you're great or not, because that's the issue here. It's just hugely popular. So you, you're, you're confident that 10 years out from now, you know, your, your book's going to be really popular. Well, then obviously it makes sense for you to stay in the copyright system, get a copyright, and then when your book gets it big, you'll be very wealthy. Why would you be opposed to the writer being paid twice if you're talking about value? In other words, if the thing has value to people in the future, why shouldn't they pay for it? Sometimes I read a book, and I'd like to pay the author every single time I read it. Well, you can do that. You can send them a check. Not really. The, the, the question is, do we want to bring the government in? Do we want to have the state enforce it? Look, People have all sorts of ideas that give value forever. I mean, think of the people that discovered electricity, that discovered television, that did all these innovations. Do we expect to send them a check every time we turn on the light? I mean, that's nuts. I'm sorry. I mean, I, mean, I think that's nuts. I mean, I, I wouldn't love to do that. Jerry, do you have any comment? Well, the fact is that uh, at least we do pay every time we put on the light. And, uh, uh, I'd like to think that authors have the same rights as a, as a utility would. Uh, look, what I'm really getting around to on this is uh, if you have a subsidy system, and that's what I call it, a voucher system, I would have no opposition to it if it was to supplement the low incomes of writers. In other words, if you start from the reality of the low incomes that you talk about, how can we improve that so that people keep writing? Rather than take away their copyright, you're walking directly into what some of the major companies like Google want to do, who are scanning books right now. And from what I hear from my colleagues in Europe, where they're also scanning books like MAD, these are copyrighted works. Google's coming under a lot of legal pressure right now on this, but their hope is to create a fait accompli, that by the time the Authors Guild's case finally is resolved in court, it'll be similar to our case, Tassini versus New York Times, around electronic rights of authors, that there'll be a new reality on the ground, and that there'll be an imposition then a call for the change of the law to catch up to the new reality that's been created by the corporations. We have to understand that there are human beings that control these corporations. They're not Coca-Cola. It's people. And people are subject to laws. They don't just, these guys shouldn't be the only ones writing them. No, I'm not afraid of the government coming in if the government is behind the people. Otherwise, We'd have a problem with Social Security, wouldn't we? Okay, someone else? Please identify yourself. <laughs> Charlotte Dennett, National Writers Union. I'm the uh, co chair of the uh, book division. And um, I, I'm really glad we're having this debate. And, um, hey, I th that is sort of an interesting point, you know, hey, we could use some subsidies, but don't take away our copyright. Uh, we used to talk about how great it was that in Canada, those writers do get subsidies from the government. 
And, you know, what's good about this debate is it's beginning to open up to the American people how incredibly abused writers are. I mean, we are phenomenally abused, and the American people don't know it. They don't know that when they walk into a bookstore, the vast majority of the writers in there uh, are not making millions of dollars, and they're lucky if they even get their books up in the front, and that's how bad it is. However, I, I, what I'm suggesting is that we have to talk more, we have to educate more about the writer's point of view. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, when you when you did your comparison of the university press book and then you're giving away something for free. I mean, first of all, from someone who works uh, in the trade media, um, <clears throat> Harper Collins was the publisher of our previous book, um, we, will, we would try not to go with the university press because they, they pay terrible advances and it's advances that book writers try to live on while they're writing their book. And I'm really, um, you know, advances for the new author can be 20,000, but they can go up to 85,000, they can go up to 100,000. And one of the reasons that you qualify to get an advance is because you are licensing um, your copyright to the publisher. You're giving the publisher a limited amount of time to do what they need to do with your book. So that I'm not sure how our, you know, our advances would would do under your system, and um, the, usually the advance, if you're not a celebrity, uh, is commensurate with what the publisher thinks is your market. But also, uh, it requires a lot of work, and that also I would I would say requires a lot of creativity. I mean, it you can put in years of work uh, to create a good book proposal and you're going to hope like hell you get a good advance that's going to sustain you. Um, that's the reality of publishing that, that needs to be addressed. And I, so, you know, the 40,000 subsidy is not going to work for me, especially if I take 18 years to write a book, okay? It, 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 it's not going to cover the expenses. Uh, another, just another little quick thing I want to uh, mention is hope and dream. Um, it's a reality among writers. We go through hell because we think we have something wonderful to write. And we might make some money. Of course, we dream that. Um, I want that dream always to be there. I, and I don't mean a whole lot of money, but I mean enough money to, to say that I could keep writing instead of having to do a second job. I need that hope there, and I'm not sure your system... It, it, uh, forcing me either or to either take your subsidy or give up my, my copyright. Uh, one last point is that um, apart from the um, magazine writers' right to resell their works, which is part of copyright, and that's how that's how some people. I know one of the plaintiffs in the Tassini case. She said she put her kid through college because she'd write an article and then she had the right to resell that right and make some more money off of it instead of giving everything away, which is what's happening now under all rights contracts. We need a union to fight for her right to keep selling rights. Uh, but also, in the age of the internet now, um, <clears throat> we're finding that there's ways uh, of tracking when our, when, our, when our work is being stolen. Or, conversely, there's also ways of tracking how our work is being used. And ideally, we're going to get compensate with every single hit or signature uh, and that would be great, because then no one's stealing our work and we're getting compensated. And if we're really popular, we're going to get a lot of hits and we're going to get more money. And that seems fair to me. Lastly, how does the publisher figure into this? Okay, a few different questions. I'll try to, to answer them all. First of all, let me just deal with this one about the tracking. I, I'm actually very not fond of the tracking, because I really don't want anyone to know what I'm reading. I really don't think it's anyone's business. So, you know, I think, you know, if I go to a bookstore and buy a book, I don't want, you know, the FBI to know I bought that book. If I download it off the web, I don't want, you know, you or anyone else to know that I download it off the web. That means you don't get paid. I'm sorry, but I really don't want people to know what I'm reading or not reading. I don't think it's anyone's business but mine. So I think we need a model that has writers be paid that doesn't require the police running around, chasing out around, figuring out who's read what. I, I, really that I, I don't think they identify who buys the book, do they? Isn't it just... This book is being bought so many times, not who's buying it. That's right. So who compensates? Where's the compensation go from? From the person itself. 
the publisher, I suppose. The publisher will work out the system. So the publisher pays it without getting money from someone? No, the publisher gets the money from somebody, but the person that bought it is not, is not uh, identified. But even today, if I go in and buy a book from a bookstore, at a bookstore and buy a book, uh, uh, the sale is recorded, the split goes to the publisher, goes to the bookseller. Uh, okay, well, I don't have to identify myself. Uh, okay, but let's go on to say, I mean, I think it'd be hard to design a system that would track my computer, you know, getting, downloading material without also knowing that who I am, or at least allowing someone to know who I am. I mean, maybe they will swear that they'll never reveal that, but at least on the face of it, it seems hard for me to envision that. But in any case, it's a technical issue, which, which we could argue about, but, but again, it, it just seems hard for me to, to, to see that. Now, again, in terms of the, the system, I, I just, you know, look, 